A couple weeks ago, we had a message, how to raise the dead. Last week, the land of the living. The last few weeks, I've been praying. I knew that God was going to have me share. I didn't know which week it was going to be. And, and I was at a prayer meeting, and I heard a dear brother in the Lord pray, God, what does it take to satisfy you? That was his prayer. This is a man that was pouring out his heart and just going through the, just, a, just a vice grip and just feeling squeezed out. Lord, what does it take to satisfy you? Maybe you've had that prayer. What do you want from me, God? And you've, and you've just shouted that out. What does it take? Lord, what are you looking for? What do you want? There are many people actually in the Bible that ask that question. Many of you that maybe right now are going through that. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, what do you want? Give me, give me a list. Show me what I need to do. God has an answer. Maybe not the answer you expect. But the Gospels are full of Jesus as he interacts with people, as they're wrestling with these things. Mark 7, verse 1 now, when the Pharisees gathered to him, Jesus, with Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. That's an interesting one. When is the last time you washed your dining couch? <laughs> and the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? We have to remember that the Jewish people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of this time, they had so gone through all the Old Testament, the Torah, and, and, and distilled the, the law down to, down to just a few commandments, just 613 of them. The to God's top 10, 10 commandments wasn't enough. No, they had to go through all the Torah, and they had to find every single last commandment because they wanted to make sure they were not breaking the commandments. And so what they did then is they had all these traditions to make sure that they didn't break the commandments. So they had rules to make sure they wouldn't break the rules. So they had just tons and tons of stuff that they were carrying. A friend of, a friend of mine was actually, after the last service, was telling me that he, on the, on the plane ride back, he was sitting next to a rabbi, and the rabbi had all these books, and he was talking about the, these laws that he had, the 613 laws, and the explanation of all these laws, and that they carried, and they're constantly carrying these laws that are weighing them down. Well, the Pharisees had these laws and had these rules and said, Jesus, your disciples aren't washing their hands. That's breaking the law. They're confronting Jesus. How does Jesus respond? Very kind and graciously. Look at verse 6. He said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Whoa. They were trying to catch Jesus and point out his sins and point out his flaws, and Jesus just rolls right out back at him. You hypocrites. Whoa, 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 whoa. In the Torah, it actually did tell them that they were supposed to wash their hands. In fact, it's, it's really kind of cool because long before we ever knew about bacteria and viruses, the Torah had told them to wash hands under running water. Nobody else was really doing that. So it was something God showed Moses and gave to the people of Israel. But they had added all these extra things to it and required it. And they said, if you don't do it the right way, you're eating defiled. And so you become defiled and you become unclean. And they had all these laws that they were, they'd added to it. But notice what Jesus said. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Their motivation was to get right with God, to be right with God so that somehow God owed them. That's really what legalism is about. I'm doing something so that I get something from you. Jesus continues in verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is given to God or a sacrifice to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his mother or father, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and many such things you do. 
So basically, Jesus is talking, they have this tradition. Okay, you know, you know from the Torah, it says, honor your father and mother. Every parent loves that verse, especially in Ephesians 6, 1, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. You better obey, right? That's what our parents tell us. The thing is, as they get older and we get older, we still are required to honor our father and mother. And some of you are in that place right now where father and mother are, you know, in, in a convalescent home where they're in an assisted living and, and it's our job now to take care of them and to sacrifice for them. Well, that happened in Jesus' day too. Um, not in the same way, but taking care of father and mother. Well, I've got some wealth here and I've been saving it up and I know mom and dad need some help, but I'd rather keep it to myself. And so what they did is they allowed them, it's called Corban, where I could dedicate this assets, this money, and I could say, this is a gift to God. I'm giving it to God. Now, the way it was done is you could give it to God, but not really give it to him, which is still kind of weird. So it basically kind of, I guess, after you die or whatever, it's going to go to God. But the result was then you didn't have to give it to your parents. You didn't have to help out mom and dad. And Jesus is confronting them and saying, you're not honoring your father and mother. You're creating loopholes to avoid the law, to avoid what was supposed to be done. You know, we do that today. We create all sorts of legal loopholes. We create these things, well, I know it says this, but because of this, it doesn't apply to me. And so then we have the, the loopholes. What legal loopholes are you jumping through? Well, Jesus returned to the washing of hands in verse, seven, or verse 14, and he called the people to him again and said to him, hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? In other words, you guys don't get it? Don't you get it? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it, it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Okay, this is a little bit confusing, but Jesus is saying, washing your hands is not the issue. In fact, what you eat is not even the issue either, because it's going to go in and it's going to go out. What comes from the heart is what's important. So in other words, here he's declaring this whole thing about clean and unclean. He says, hey, all foods are clean. It doesn't matter. All right? This is what he's saying here, but the point is not the food. The point is not the clean. The point is what's in your heart. Look at the next verse, 20. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. They were so fixated on being clean and being right that they weren't concerned with what was on the inside. They were only concerned with what was on the outside. It was legalism. It was legalism. Legalism, always the appearance about how do I appear and about leverage. How can I control? How can I look good so that I can control you? I'm doing something so that I can get favor, so that I can get notice. You know, we, we go to a lawyer. Why do we go to a lawyer? To protect ourselves and to get something from somebody else. That's what we go to a lawyer because that's what legalism is. And somehow we think that we can be legalistic with God and that if I do the right things, then God owes me. No, we don't say it, but we act like it. And we think that, well, but God, I've been going to church faithfully. Why did my car break down? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? What did... God, I've been giving faithfully. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Do you hear? It, it, we, the question is like, oh, honest question. But do you hear the connection? I've been doing this, God, so why did this happen? Why did this bad thing happen? You believe that somehow you're able to control God by what you do. And then your theology is getting rocked because God's saying, no, it's not about what you do. He's not concerned about your outward actions. He's concerned about your heart. He's concerned about your heart. See, these Pharisees thought that they could somehow control God because if they did all 613 commandments and then they added all that the Talmud and, and all the other things say that they're supposed to do, that somehow God was going to give them what they wanted. <laughs> that's, that's not the gospel. In fact, traditions, traditions, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about traditions and legalism, and somehow the traditions are the right way, right? The tradition, for example, the tradition is that you come to church, we sing some songs, maybe there's some announcements, then there's a sermon, then we pray, then you go home. Is that what defines church? 
Some of you are like, yeah. I mean, that's what everybody else is doing uh, around the United States right now. There's thousands of churches, and that's what they're going to do. They're going to sing. They're going to pray. Somebody's going to get up front and talk, and then everybody's going to go home. Do you know what? The church is not a spectator sport. Most people come to church to sit, listen, feed me. <sighs> okay, do I feel some goosebumps? Oh, uh, not so much today. <sighs> oh, well, maybe next week. And then they leave. That's not what the church is about. The church is about coming together to see Jesus lifted up, right? To be all about Jesus. Did you know that prior to Martin Luther, the central focus of the church, actually, I'm sorry, since Martin Luther, the central focus of the church has been the sermon. During the first service last week, we didn't have a sermon. (gasps) You're breaking tradition. Like, Like, is that legal? Can you actually have a, is that, does it count? Like some of you are like, how did I miss that one? I wanted to go to that one. <laughs> we, we've lifted, actually, basically Martin Luther, he wanted to take the focus off the Eucharist, off the communion, because the Catholic Church at that time had made that, that the central focus of the service. And so Martin Luther says, no, that, that's not the central focus. And he made the, the sermon more important. And gradually over the last 500 years, we've made the sermon the most important thing because the sermon is what it's all about. The sermon and the pastor and the teacher and what happens during the sermon, that determines, that defines church. Not if you look at the New Testament. We've got lots of traditions. Well, but I like the sermon. That's fine. Do you have to have a sermon? Some of you are like, well, no. But if you're not going to give me one, I'm going to find one that I'm going to find a church that does. There's plenty of churches that got sermons for you. You can go online and listen to lots of sermons. But the idea of church is that we're coming together to see Jesus lifted up. That's the idea of church. Now, is he lifted up in song? Yeah. Is he lifted up in testimony? Yes. Is he lifted up in prayer? Yes. That's church. You can get together and have church in a lot of different ways. It's not about the message. It's not about the sermon. Well, the Pharisees had their traditions. They had their, all their stuff figured out. And so Jesus had another parable to tell them. And you know the parable of the, the story of the prodigal son? And in the story of the prodigal son, the focus of the prodigal son, everybody today, most of the time when we read the prodigal son story, we're focused on, oh, that, here's this guy. And, and you know the story. It's a, a Luke 15. Then Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. All right? And we know the focus. It's like basically this, this younger son said, hey, dad, I've had enough of you. To me, you're dead. I wish you were dead. Just give me my share of the inheritance so I can go. That's basically what happened. How rude it was. The Pharisees are listening to this story, and they're like, how audacious. How could he do that? How could this younger son do that? Oh, oh, we would never do that. And Jesus is, 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 it's kind of a trap. He's leading them right to, because everybody's focused on, wow, this amazing grace, this amazing thing, because you know that the prodigal son basically comes to his senses, turns around, says, I can't believe what I did. God, forgive me. And then he comes back to the father, God, forgive me. And then the, the father throws a party, right? And we think that's the story of the prodigal son. No, that's not the focus. That's not the main point of the prodigal son story. When you read that whole chapter, it's about a lost coin, a lost sheep, and this parable is about two lost sons. The one is the prodigal son, and the other is the elder son. Look at the elder son, and look what he responds. The elder son, when he comes back and he sees that there's a party going on in the house, and he's already figured out that his younger brothers come in. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fattened calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. You can just hear the animosity, the anger, the rage in this older son. I never disobeyed you, and yet you never gave me anything. And here, this younger son who lost all your stuff, you're throwing a party for him? You can hear this, just this, oh, oh. 
I've never disobeyed, and yet you never gave me a young goat. Look at the father's response. But as soon as the son of yours came, or this is, he's still saying, as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fattened calf. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now, pull back. The Pharisees are hearing the story. They see all the, the tax collectors, the, 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 the prostitutes, the drunkards, all gathering around Jesus, and they're pointing fingers. I can't believe Jesus eats with these sinners. And Jesus is trying to make them a point that the Pharisees are missing. He's really talking about them, that they're this elder brother thinking that, look, look, we've always done the right thing. We've always obeyed. Look what that elder elder son son says. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat. You never gave me anything. The father's response is, all that I have is yours. I already gave it to you, and you didn't even realize it. The son was so fixated on controlling the father. He wanted the father's goods, but he didn't want the relationship with the father. Like many Christians, we're trying to be good, thinking that if we're keeping the commandments, that somehow we're filled with self-righteousness and somehow God owes us something. What will satisfy God? What will satisfy you, God? My question for you today to think about How are you bribing God? Are you bribing God? Are you doing things to get on his good side? Are you not doing things to get on his good side? Well, I I never do that. Oh, is that self-righteousness coming out? Well, no, 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 no. I'm just not like that sinner. Self-righteousness, it's kind of oozing out of me. It's hard not to talk and let the self-righteousness not come out. It comes out as soon as I start judging or looking at anybody else, I'm self-righteous. And it starts to ooze out of me. You know, your, your kids come up to you and they say, Daddy, I love you, right? And you're like, okay, what's next? <laughs> now, sometimes it is, sometimes it's truly just, you, and you love it, you're just kind of waiting, and when there's nothing afterwards, it's like, wow, that was a real... Well, you know, a real hug there, a genuine hug. But a lot of times it's, Daddy, I love you. Can I borrow the car? Can I have this? Can I do this? Can I... And the whole thing is I'm doing something that I know you like and I know that you enjoy so that you'll give me something that I enjoy. But that's bribery, right? Are we doing it with God? It's not a matter of are we. The real question is where are we doing it with God? God doesn't want your service. He wants your heart. And that's what he says to the Pharisees. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He said that. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want a list of to-dos. He doesn't want a list of laws. Do this, do this, do this. But we like, just, just okay, go, go, go. okay. God, this, this whole thing with you, can you just tell me what to do? Do you hear that? When a person says, just tell me what to do, They don't want relationship. They want legalism. God was going to, if you remember, uh, on the mountain, when God gives them the Ten Commandments, they hear his voice. But you know what? They said, you know what, Moses? You talk to God. He's too much. We don't want a a direct relationship with him. You just tell us what to do. Legalism. And the church is filled with it. Our lives are filled with it. Paul addresses this in Colossians 2, verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Verse 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So notice, there are people that want to come in and deceive you. It's so often, this is what happens. A person gets saved. God, thank you. It's amazing. Uh, Grace, I just, I don't know how to, uh, wow. Just wow. And then, an older person in the faith comes along and says, here, now let me disciple you. And usually that discipleship involves, okay, now that you're a Christian, you need to read the Bible every day. You need to pray every day. An hour would be good. Why don't you start with an hour? And then we start adding these lists of to-do things, right? 
Now, is it good to pray? Yes. Is it good to read your Bible? Yeah, of course. But what's the motivation? How'd you do on that Bible reading? How many verses you got memorized? You know, like we, we do Awana here. We just started Awana this, this year, this fall, which is great. And hiding God's word in our hearts is great. Yet if the focus is on, did you get your verse memorized? Then we missed it. It's not about memorizing the verse. Yes, that's important, but it's about relationship. And the verse helps me understand the relationship. So don't let anyone deceive you. Lest you should be deceived with persuasive words. There are believers, there are Christians out there, there are pastors out there that are not trying to deceive you, but they are deceived. I can't, I can't tell you how many messages that I've preached as, a, as somebody that loves God and has been trained and, and, and studied. But I realized when I stepped back and I look, I, I was... I was heaping burdens upon people that they had to do, that you gotta do this, you gotta do this, and you, you really, if you're really serious about God, you need to do this, right? Is that what God calls us to? It says, verse six, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Jesus? By a bunch of to-do lists? You received him by faith. So then how do we walk out this walk of sanctification? By a bunch of to-do lists? No, by faith. We are saved by grace, and we are sustained and maintained by grace. But so often what happens is we get saved, okay, and now I'm saved, and the Spirit of God lives in me, so now I can fulfill the law. And you'll have some people that will come alongside you and teach you that. It's not what it says. As you've therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him with established in the faith, established in the faith, and abounding in thanksgiving. Verse eight, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So there are people out there that are trying to cheat you and they're tr they come along with the, it says the, through philosophy and empty deceit. Basically there are people that can take Bible verses and stack them up and it's like, whoa, whoa, I need to do this. If I'm really serious about God, I gotta do this. And you gotta obey all the law because that's, that's, the, way, that's the character of God. And there's people that come and tell us this and it's like, no, he says, that's tradition, it's philosophy, it's empty deceit. It's the basic principles of the world, and it's not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness, and you're complete in him. You're not complete by doing a bunch of stuff. You're not complete by, well, I gotta obey the commandments, you know? Like God's top 10, the 10 commandments. Like, those are important, right? Those are God's top 10. Hmm, let's see what it says. Let's keep going. Verse 13. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your heart, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That is one of the best verses in the Bible. Read that last, last part. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross. Basically, it's a whole list. Every one of us has a list. Everyone has a list. Mike's list, and it lists all the sins that Mike's ever committed and that Mike ever will commit. They're all listed. And that list, then, Jesus says that he takes your list, he nails it to the cross, and nails it with the blood and stuff, and writes, paid in full. Isn't that amazing? Your list is paid in full. Not just the sins that you committed yesterday, last week, before you came to Christ, the sins you're going to commit today. The sins you committed on the way to church here. And some of you are like, oh, yeah. Because I know there's a spiritual battle just to get to church. But the, the sins you'll commit tomorrow, they're already paid for. Whoa, how does that make you feel? Your sins, they're already paid for? They're already, they're, in fact, they're not just paid for, they're canceled, they're just like, they're gone. So many of us are, 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 are Christians and we're walking around like this. Okay, I gotta make sure I don't step in it again like I did back there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm walking, I don't wanna step in it, uh, okay? And so we're walking like this. Instead of walking in freedom, like, I don't care. I can walk anywhere I want because I have freedom in Christ. And some of you are like, did he just, he walked on chairs in church? You can't do that. 
yes, I can do that. I have freedom in Christ, and I can walk through. <laughs> Actually, this is kind of fun. Hey, John. No, the point being, I gotta be careful. I might fall for real. The idea is that if I'm really free in Christ, I'm not worried about where I'm gonna step. I'm not worried about this whole list of, don't do this, don't do that. I mean, did he leave a footprint? You know, there's all these little things. We're wondering, is somebody gonna brush off those seats? And we can start worrying, but no, just walk in freedom. Walk, I, I, I've got nothing holding me down. I've got nothing holding me back because my sins are gone, they're canceled. The, there's, there's no evidence that I stepped on those chairs. Some of you are like, uh, you're looking. No, in God's sight, there's no evidence. It's, it's washed away. It's washed away. I am free. Wow. That, that's a huge burden lifted. I was so worried I was going to mess up tomorrow. I am, but I'm not worried about it because God's covered, paid in full. Wow. How does that change everything? It changes everything. As a result, Paul says, I don't want you to get trapped. I don't want you to get deceived. Verse 16, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a foreshadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Notice the things he points to. He talks about new moons. In other words, those are like holidays, um, the holy festivals, um, Sabbaths food, drink, what you eat. Remember, there's a whole debate among the Jews. Well, can, you, can I have that bacon cheeseburger now that I'm a Christian? Bacon's bad, but it tastes so good. You're free in Christ. Now, some of you I know have chosen for health reasons, you're not gonna have bacon, that's fine. But it's for health reasons, not because I'm under the law. No, I'm free in Christ. Remember, Jesus said, it's not what goes into you that defiles you. So I'm free. And it says, don't let anyone look down on you. Don't let anyone heap this law on you based on whether you celebrate the Sabbath or not. What day of the week is Sabbath? It's actually Saturday, yeah. So how many of you observed the Sabbath and made sure that you didn't do anything, any work? Some of you did, some of you didn't. But that's not the point. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're observing Sabbath or because you're not observing Sabbath. No one passed judgment on you. These are a foreshadow of the things to come. Sabbath is a shadow. You know, we got bright lights here, but we got bright lights behind, but you can see my shadow, right? Now, can you see it? See it on the floor? Okay. And I can do different things. And the shadow moves, but that's not what's important. My wife, if my wife came up and started, and started kissing the shadow, you'd be like, we need to pray for her. But that's what some of you are doing. You're kissing the shadow. You're kissing the law. You're kissing it thinking, thinking that I, I, I love God's word and I love his law. And so I'm just, I'm just going to kiss the shadow instead of kissing the real thing, which is Jesus. 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 The shadows were meant to point to Jesus, not to take the place of Jesus. They're pointing to Jesus. That's, that's where the focus is. Jesus, oh, we get hung up on so, so many other things. You know, this is such an important topic, and yet it gets, it gets washed over in the body of Christ because, you know, because honestly, most messages are how to have a best life now, how to, and you fill in the gap, how to manage your kids, how, and all these how-to messages, and what are how-to messages? Usually to-do lists, right? With all these do, 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 and in God's eyes, they're just do-do, yeah. right? Because he's like, no, no, you want a do to do list, and you just instead just you just need Christ. You just need a relationship with Jesus. Well, I have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, but you want the to do list so that you don't have to talk to him. And he's like, no, 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 talk to me. That's what I want. Not a list of things to do and not do. This this topic is so important that Paul talks about it most of chapter two in Colossians, most of chapter 14 of Romans. Chapters 1 through 5 in Galatians, chapters 8 through 11 in 1 Corinthians, Titus chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 4, multiple chapters in the book of Acts. This message is so important about not getting under the burden of the law and not walking in the law, not worshiping the shadow, that he talks about it over and over and over and over. And that's not to mention all the passages in Hebrews and in Romans 
that tries to show this balance of the law and grace. So let no one pass judgment, verse 16, Colossians 2. No one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival, new moon, or Sabbath. They are a shadow of the things to come. Hebrews 10, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities, it, meaning the law, can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The law will never make you perfect. But we have this belief. Well, I know the law will never make me perfect, but once I've come to Christ, I'm filled with the Spirit, now I can be perfect. Uh, no, you're still going to sin. You're still going to... But, but that doesn't mean, oh, no, shall, you know, shall we sin that grace may abound? And, and Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7. He goes over those things. Paul's point here is that the shadow, we don't worship the shadow. We don't kiss the shadow. We want a relationship with Jesus. We want to give Jesus our hearts. He goes on in Colossians 2. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. In other words, there's people that are going to come and disqualify you and say, you need asceticism, insisting on asceticism. Asceticism is strict discipline. You know, when we did the extreme discipleship a few months back, the extreme discipleship was this part of the Nazarite vow from number six. And it was basically saying, you know what? We encourage you to try this, to, to press into God and deny yourself. It's an extreme fast was what it was. And some would say, well, it's asceticism in some ways. And we give it to you as an option. But we don't insist and say, well, if you really want to be serious about God, you need to do this. No, that's not the point. No, we're not going to insist on it. But it is something... And in a sense, denying myself, Lord, I want to remove the noise, so I want to hear your voice because I want relationship with you. If that's the heart, God shows up. But if I'm doing all these things so that, God, I'm, I'm fasting and I'm giving up food and I'm, I'm giving up Facebook and I'm giving up all these things so that now, God, you got to give me. That's legalism. Now, you may not say it that way, but in your heart, is that what you're expecting? I'm expecting, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny myself of all these things so that, God, I, I, you need to answer me now. Do you hear the tone of voice? You need to answer me now? Are you going to talk to me that way? You wouldn't talk to your, earth, hopefully, you wouldn't talk to your earthly parent that way. But yet we kind of assume the same from God. Insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels. Then we look at, oh, worship of angels. He's talking about new age stuff. No, 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 no. Angels, in the, in the Greek here, it really means messengers. Worship of messengers. Do we have that in the church today? You betcha. They're called rock star pastors. Yeah, we worship those. Yo, have you heard this message by Matt Chandler? Oh, oh, um, Francis Chan, I love this guy. Oh, no, no, Stephen, Stephen Furtick. Oh, man, he has got so much energy, such passion. Oh, you've got to see this. And the result is we get, we get riled up about these guys, and we, we start lifting up these guys. Worship of messengers is really what it is. And you can fill in the blank, whether it's a Joyce Meyer, a Beth Moore. A, you know, you fill in your blank, okay? Somebody in the last service said Ty Ryder. I'm like, okay. But the point is, nobody said at this service, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> but the point is, when you leave, you shouldn't be thinking, wow, he's such a gifted communicator. Wow, I just, I love his points, he's oh, so, so good. Or, or, no, you should be leaving thinking, wow, what a great savior. Wow, God is so good. That's what we should be leaving. But so often we're impressed by the, the, the oratory skills of the person speaking that we miss what the point is. We're worshiping the shadow. We're kissing the shadow. Colossians 2.19, and not holding fast to the head. <sighs> Hold on to the head. Not your favorite Bible teacher. Colossians 2.20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used and according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they're of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All this list of to do, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. They don't help you get closer to God. What helps you get closer to God is simply relationship with God. 
talking to God. Trying to keep the law is really a delusion that you can become God, right? No one can keep the law. In fact, the whole reason, the, the whole point of the law is to show you that you can't keep the law. If you, if you disbelieve me, Jesus, in explaining the law in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what he says, Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus, who are you talking to? Well, that's the point. The point is that we're supposed to be perfect. And the law is supposed to bring us to that place of like, I can't do this. Even as a Christian, I can't do this. In our self-righteousness, Jesus had to amplify that. And, and be, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I've never cheated on my wife. What did Jesus say? Verse 27, you heard it said that those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, okay, well, but I've never killed anybody. Well, you know, Jesus goes on and explains that one too. And he says, if you've even been angry with somebody, you're guilty of murder. The whole point of the law is to show you that you can't keep the law. But so many Christians, once we get saved, well, but now I can. You're being deceived. You're being bewitched, as Paul tells the Galatians in chapter 3. Galatians 2, 16, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And sometimes you hear people talk, well, there's the moral law and there's the ceremonial law. And we're no longer required to keep the ceremonial law. But the question is, who decides? Because there's no verse in the Bible that says, this is a moral law, this is a ceremonial law. There's no verse that says that. And then pretty soon we become God because we're the ones deciding, well, I like this one, so I'm going to keep this one. I don't like that one. I like the bacon. Okay, we're going to keep it. And, and so we go through the list. And God's like, no, 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 no. And that's why, that's why some of our messianic friends, that they're beloved messianic brothers and sisters that love Jesus and, and are, I think are, fulfill, are, are walking in, in truth. But there are, there are some, though, that are caught up in the legalism and saying, well, now that I'm a believer, I'm empowered, and so i got to keep it all. No, that's the whole point. If you read the gospel and you read the epistles, Paul is continuing to hammer away. No, no circumcision, no dietary laws, no laws. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where you, where, 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 you said no law, but, but we, we come back to God's top 10, right? And in fact, there's even the Sabbath. Oh, Sabbath is in the top 10, right? So, I mean, obviously we should keep the top 10. The top 10 are like, you know, actually here's a question. How many of you can name the top 10? There's like only a couple people raising hands. So like, do not murder, um, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, honor your parents, all those. Okay, so like, yeah, those are good commandments. Yeah, we should do those. But this thing of the Sabbath, do we need to keep that? Interesting, in the New Testament, there's no place in the New Testament reaffirming keeping the Sabbath. But wait a second, that's one of God's top 10. All the others are reaffirmed by Jesus or by the apostles in the New Testament. But that one's not. Why? Because the Sabbath is a shadow it's Jesus. The Sabbath speaks of Jesus and speaks of the rest. God rested on the seventh day. Jesus, when he said it is done, it is finished, he rested from his work as the high priest. So he is our Sabbath. So the result is we don't have to keep the Sabbath. We're freed from that, from that law. Okay, but what about the other nine? You mean I don't have to love my brother? I mean, like, like no, 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 no. What, what, what does this say? Well, Jesus says in, in 5.17 Matthew, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay. So he's not going to destroy the law, but we're not under law, right? Verse Romans 6, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, I like that verse. But then he defines it a little bit. He explains. Here's what happens. In Romans 7, um, Paul, Paul explains, do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So you, you know how it works. We, we make those vows till death do us part, right? But if I go get married after I've made that vow and she's still alive, I'm an adulterer. But if she dies, the law says, I am free. I'm free. I can go marry another person, even though I was married to her, but she died. She's gone on. 
So I'm freed from the law. Here he's saying the same thing. Notice this next verse, verse four. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. We're no longer bound to the law. We are bound to Christ. Oh, that's such an amazing verse. I'm freed. I'm freed from the law of sin and death. In order that we may bear fruit to God, verse five, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We've been set free. We're no longer under the law. All of it. But, 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 but wait a second. Do not commit murder. Like, come on. Well, give you an example. How, how does Jesus fulfill the law, and how is it that I'm freed from the law, and then I'm not under, I'm not under the law? Think about like this. Here I got a picture of an airplane. And, you know, air, air, air travel is pretty cool, right? I mean, it's fast, it's, you know, it's high and all this stuff. Now, I can try as hard as I might, at best, I probably have like a 24 inch vertical jump, okay? White men can't jump. So I'm, I, can't, I ain't going anywhere. I can jump as hard as I want, but I ain't going up. But when I get in the airplane, I'm in the airplane, and now all of a sudden, I am like defying gravity, right? I'm no longer bound to the law of gravity. And here's what's really wild. The longer I'm in the airplane, if it was like a spatial type airplane, you know, it keeps going, what happens is the further away that you get into the atmosphere? Gravity actually in the airplane even gets less and less until you are weightless. And so I'm no longer, when I'm in the plane, in a sense, as you go up high enough, you no longer, you're just like, I am no longer bound. I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer, I'm just floating. That's how you and I are in Christ. He is our airplane. He is our, our propitiation. He is the one that satisfies everything. He fulfills the law. And if I'm in him, I'm no longer bound. I am free. I'm floating in a sense. And, and, and it, that picture is just so beautiful because if the earth represents that law of sin and the law of gravity, the further away I get from that, the freer I am. Now, does that mean that I can just do whatever I want? Remember, we want, we, well, okay, so you're free to, do whatever, free, free to do whatever you want. You don't have a to-do list. Well, is that what it says? No, it's not about that. It's about a relationship. If I have the relationship with Jesus, all the other takes care of itself. See, some people say, well, oh, whoa, 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 pastor, there's that verse in, um, in 1 John 5 where it says, if you love me, you obey my commands, right? Right? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. See, there it is. God shoots the whole thing down. Notice the rest of this verse. And his commandments do not weigh us down because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. Do you see that picture of the airplane? The commandments don't weigh us down because God, they're fulfilled in Jesus. And he's the one. He's fulfilled the commandments. He's the one lifting us up. So the result is I'm not weighed down by the commandments because he's fulfilled them. I'm no longer carrying the commandments. I'm no longer struggling under the, the penalty of sin because my, my record's been paid for. All my sins, even the future, they're paid for. And, and as a result, I'm no longer weighed down by my sins. Uh, go back to that verse. Because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. To as many as received him, to those who believed in his name. You know that verse. If we receive Jesus, we are, have, we are in him. We are born again. We become a child of God. So as many as received him have been fathered by God, conquers the world. This is the conquering power that has conquered the world. Our faith. Not our to-do list. You know, we, we, we take that verse and see the commandments of God. See, oh, you got to come back to the commandments. you got to fulfill the commandments. And here's the to-do list. It's not the commandments that conquer the world. It's our faith that conquers the world. It's, we're, we're free. Now, who is the person who has conquered the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the one who is in Christ? You know, in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it only uses the word Christian a few times. And those few times that it uses the word Christian, it's actually, it's like what other people called um, the, the believers. And it was actually meant to be a derogatory term. Christian means little Christ. Oh, you little Christ. What they really refer to, what a better term to refer to Christians is those who are in him, who are in the airplane, who are no longer bound by this world. They are free in Christ. 
That's you and I. So, Romans 13, verse 8. What law do we have then? Only this. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If I have a love relationship with Jesus and I'm just focused on loving Jesus, the law is fulfilled. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled it and I'm operating in him and the rest doesn't matter. Well, but, 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 but maybe we should do the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a great thing. Don't have to do that. Well, you should celebrate Passover. No, I don't. But Sabbath, you need to have a Sabbath rest. I do need, my body needs rest, that's true. But I, I'm not going to feel condemned if I don't have a Sabbath. I'm not under the law. Now, obviously it's not wise to go long without taking rest and take sabbaticals and take time. We need that. But I'm not under the law. I'm in Christ. And if I'm in Christ, I am free. So what will satisfy God? Just loving him. Relationship with him. It's not a to-do list. It's not what do I have to do. It's simply, Jesus, what are we doing today? Let's pray. Lord God, Jesus, thank you that all you desire is our hearts. You desire our love, but you don't force it. And there's no way that we can work it up by trying harder. We are not under bondage. We are not under law. We are free because you fulfilled the law, because you did it. Thank you, God, that you're the one that lifts us up. Thank you that you're the one that sets us free. So God, now help us to walk in that freedom, to listening to your voice, and not following after another set of to-do lists. Lord, may we not go back to our to-do list, but may we go back to our Savior. Thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week with Jesus.